Hello Neighbor, Missing Pieces. Prologue. That isn't dreaming, my grandma used to say. That's your soul getting into trouble. I was what my parents called a restless sleeper. My grandma knew better, though. It's like she was there when I closed my eyes and drifted off. When I would wake up, she'd make me wash my hands, just like she did first thing every morning. She'd click her tongue while she scrubbed my hands raw, shaking off the water and raking them dry with a towel. You're the wandering type, she'd say sometimes. Your soul makes your body wander, makes you get lost. Then she would watch me closely as I ran off to my room to get dressed for the day. Even after I closed the door, I could hear her scolding me. You stop that wandering boy chick, or one day you won't make it home! That's when my dreams turned to nightmares. My grandma was nearly blind when she died, but she saw me clearer than anyone ever has. Until I met Aaron. Chapter 1 Nicholas now means now! Mum yells from the foot of the stairs. With the house empty, her voice bounces toward me like a ball, careening off the walls and straight through my aching head. Give him another minute, Lou! Dad's voice is quieter, but the sound of it still hurts. I know they think I was up all night doing something I wasn't supposed to be doing, like playing video games and eating cheese whiz from the can, but I was actually up all night doing nothing at all. I was staring at the wall, then staring at the ceiling, then staring at the fly that got stuck on the tail end of the packing tape that came loose from the box holding my tools and three dismantled CB radios. We're paying the movers by the hour, Jay. Either he comes now, or the new tenants are going to have to adopt him. Time to go, Narf, Dad says as I trudge down the stairs. And I smile because Dad's trying. In her own way, I think Mum's trying too. Yikes, Dad says after Mum kisses me a little too hard on the head and walks out the door. What? That smile is fooling no one. It looks creepy, he says. I stop, and now we can both relax. I know this is bad, he says, rubbing the back of his head. Devastatingly bad. It's just a few states over, I say, repeating what Mum has said every day for the past three months. That's light years away, says Dad, and thank the giant space alien overlords that someone is finally telling the truth. Yeah, my legions of friends begged me not to go. They made me promise I'd write. I say, and a smile slips from Dad's face because he knows I'm faking it again. This just wasn't your city, he says. Raven Brooks, though. Raven Brooks will be your city. He closes the door to the house that never really felt like my house, just like the last one didn't and the one before that. Goodbye, Red House, Mum says as she eyes it in the rearview mirror, following the moving truck a little too closely down the long driveway. She gets teary-eyed. And Dad gives her shoulder a little squeeze. Raven Brooks will be our city, he says again, this time so Mum can hear it, and she looks about as convinced as I feel. We drive 715 miles in near silence, swallowing the lie that Raven Brooks really isn't that far from Charleston. Just like we swallowed that the lie that the blue house in Ontario was any different from the brown house in Oakland, or the yellow house in Reading, or the beige house in Coa Delane. The lies get a little bigger with each move, with each realisation that towns don't need newspaper editors if they don't have newspapers to edit anymore. But landlords still need rent money no matter what. So, what was one more move, one more town, one more new school and new house that wouldn't really be our house anyway? I only had to get used to it for a little while. This time, maybe I won't, maybe I won't even unpack. Chapter 2. The new house is turquoise. I'd call it more of a blue-green, Mum says, tilting her head like maybe that would change the colour. Teal, Dad offers. It used to be a very popular colour for exteriors. Dad knows nothing about exteriors, or colours for that matter. That's the thing about newspaper editors, though. They can sound like experts on just about anything. Wasn't it white in the pictures, Mum asks? The moving truck rumbles up the otherwise quiet street called I Swear to the Aliens Friendly Court. Then the driver leans out the window. This one yours? The turquoise one? Mum drops her head. <sighs> I give up. Dad nods to the driver. 
Yes, the turquoise one. The truck reverses and backs into the driveway. And just like that, we're Jay Luane and Nicky Roth of 909 Friendly Court, Ravenbrooks. This fall, I'll be an eighth grader at Ravenbrooks Middle School, where I'll excel in science and English and struggle in maths and Spanish. I'll be that short kid in the Beatles t-shirt, whom everyone mistakenly calls Nate, with the brown hair that sticks up on the left side no matter how much water I use to flatten it. I'll eat jello pudding packs every day and clear the lunch table because there's no reason why I shouldn't and I'll spend the rest of the lunch period taking things apart and putting them back together. It's a nice street, Dad says of the mostly pristine lawns and neatly shuttered windows. The paint is a little faded, the cars are a little old, but we've lived on worse blocks and I even see a cat or two crouched in flower beds across the street. Cats feel like a good sign. It's quiet. Mum says, and it's hard to tell if that's praise or worry in her voice. There's a llama farm, I say, and my parents look at me. I, I, I saw a sign, I explain, and then we're quiet again. Well, Dad says after a while, I think I've earned a ho-ho. Mum's always complaining that Dad never lost his childhood sweet tooth, but there's a grown-up method to his sugar madness. Once you figure out the pattern, it's pretty easy to tell how Dad's feeling. Ho-ho's mean, means he's exhausted. Ding-dongs are the treat of choice for when he's happy. Pounding down Susie Quees, it's time to celebrate. But the real telltale cakes are the yellow ones. Zingers can only mean one thing. Dad's sad. Twinkies are for when he's pondering life's big questions. Big alien overlord in the sky questions. Mum sighs. <sighs> Jay, you've had three already. What's that, dear? I can't hear you. It's ho, ho o'clock. I start to follow them into the house, but decide to take in the quiet of the street a little bit longer. Maybe if I hang out long enough, one of the cats will come over. I take a seat on the curb in front of our new turquoise house and pull the long blades of grass that shoot up on either side of me. I'm lost in thoughts of my latest project, a knot of old padlocks I found in an empty lot by the red house. Five different padlocks, all interlocked with no keys. I've managed to pick two of them, but the other three are giving me trouble. Locks are my new project, specifically lock picking. It feels like I'm taking something apart without actually deconstructing it, like I'm discovering the secret from the inside out. I tried to explain it to Mum once, but I don't think she understood. She's more into stuff you can see under a microscope. I think you're amazing, Nikki, she'd say, and she would tilt my chin up to meet her stern gaze. Just use your powers for good. That's the warning she attaches to pretty much everything I do, a reminder that even the smartest people can make dumb decisions. Movement from across the street breaks my trance, and at first I think it's one of the cats, but I don't see them anymore. All I see is a curtained billow on the second story of the house across the street. I stare harder, but I can't see whoever moved the curtain. All I see is the reflection of a twisted oak tree that practically touches the window. It looms so close. Someone was watching me, though. That's a feeling you just know, like when the air smells different before a storm. I watch the window for a little bit longer until I get sick of waiting. Stare at me all you want, I tell the empty window. Nothing to see here. I stand to go inside, already folding on my decision not to unpack. Maybe just the box with the padlocks, I think. Then I hear a tiny mewing sound behind me. One of those all grey cats with blue eyes. He looks like he's been rolling in campfire ash all night. Even his whiskers look dusty. He winds his body around my leg, making a figure eight and circling my other ankle. On his side is a greasy black streak, like he's been, like he's been siddling up to a newly waxed car tyre. Hey cat, I say. I've never been great with names. He mews in response. You live across the street? Another mew. Well, tell Creeper up there that it's not polite to stare. I reach for his head to scratch behind his ears, but then he locks eyes with me, and something changes. The fur on his tail and spine stand on end, and his ears fall back against his skull. Eyes wide, he's suddenly a different cat. A quick kiss and a swipe, and my new friend leaves a long, fine scratch along my hand and wrist. Yanking my hand away, I'm about to shoo him off when I see him staring up at, at the window across the street. And this time, the curtain is pulled back. A face, I think it's a face, hovers at the edge of the frame, not exactly hiding, 
but not front and centre either. Maybe it's the glare of the sun off the glass, but the face is so white. I'm nearly positive it's just a light fixture or something I'm seeing, but no. Those are eyes and a nose. The cat hisses again, still staring at the window. Then his fur lowers, his ears pull forward, and he stands from his crouch, returning his focus to me. I look back at the window and see the same billowing curtain as before. No face, no glare, just fabric behind glass. I don't think you and I are going to be friends, I say to the cat, or maybe to the face in the window. Either way, the cat slinks across the street to his flower bed, and I retreat to my new house to see which locks are easiest to pick. I wake up and forget where I am for a minute. One of my least favourite things about moving, the room doesn't smell like mine yet. In Charleston, it smelled like a mix of salted meat and vanilla air freshener. Here, it smells the way the main library in Cower de Lane smelled, like old wood and a little bit of mould. My sheets are soaked with sweat, and I dig a new shirt out of an open box before giving up on sleep for the rest of the night. Not a chance I'll be able to shake that nightmare. I never can. I was in the grocery store again, sitting in, in, in the shopping cart, my feet dangling high above the floor. It was cold and dark, and the shelves of canned foods towered so high above me, I was afraid they were going to fall and crush me. Like always, I wanted to get out of the cart, to find help or find out where I was. But like always, I was afraid to move. It's weird. In the dream, I'm frozen. In real life, I would give anything for my family to stay in one place for once. Then I remember that the scariest place my dreams take me is to the grocery store, and I decide that I probably shouldn't try to make too much sense out of them. I drag my locks to the deep windowsill that faces the street. It's the coolest part of my new room, this built-in bench that creates the perfect spot to sit and stare out at the high rest of Friendly Court. I can see all the way to the highway if I face the right direction. For now, though, all I see is the house across the street, which is fine because I know I'm the only one up at. Up at. I turn my watch over on my desk. 3.15. I press my hand over my eyes and cut my forehead. M massaging my temples, it's going to be a long day. I unearth my pick set and get to work on the lock that's been giving me the most trouble. With my flashlight, I try to see as far into the hall as I can, but it's a classic shrouded shackle, and I can see only so far. I've been using the torsion wrench to hold the plug in place, but the half-diamond pick is too rigid to make it very far through those angles. Ball pick, I say under my breath, rummaging through the worn leather case of tools I bought from some kid just outside of Charleston who seemed a little too eager to get rid of it. There you are, I say to the, to the titanium alloy stick with the circle tip. I start to work the pick through the lock and make it around one corner, then another, until the pin starts to lift. Almost there, I say, a familiar rush of besting the lock beginning to wash over me. Maybe this day won't be so bad after all. Then a scream cuts through the night air. I drop the knot of locks on the floor and the crash echoes through the house, but I'm not focused on that. I'm straining to hear the last echoes of the scream that should have woken the entire neighbourhood. Not a single light on the street flickers, though. Not one head pops out their front door to see what's going on. The voice was high and ragged, and at first it sounded like a child, but then I'm not so sure. I've heard some pretty convincing goats make that screaming sound, and there was that llama farm we saw on the way into town. I hold so still I forget to blink, and my eyes water until I rub them. When my vision clears, I'm staring once again at the window on the second story of the house across the street. This time, I'm sure I see a face staring back at me. You again, I whisper, and I half expect to hear an answer. Instead, the head moves closer to the window, eventually pressing against the pane. Hands cup around the face like binoculars, and I do the same. I'm staring at a boy who looks my age. It might be the glare of moonlight or the contrast against the night sky, but the kid's hair looks almost white, like he got struck by lightning in an old sci-fi movie. We stand there, hand shielding our faces, staring for a strangely long time, and just when I'm starting to get a little uncomfortable with this game of chicken, he slaps his hand against the window, 
a yellow sheet of notebook paper glowing in front of the circular light of a flashlight. Don't you know it's not polite to stare? You heard me talking to the cat. I take my hand from the window and back up a little, looking for the string to pull the shade. Before I find it, though, the kid drops the note and flickers his light to get my attention. Then he slaps another note on, on the window. Then he smiles. The ball pick was a good choice. I look down at my kit and the knot of locks, feeling found out, but instead of being embarrassed, I feel relieved. I rummage for a piece of paper and a marker we've been using to label boxes. I think for a second, then hold my flashlight up to my own message. Bored, I need something tougher. The kid smiles and he ducks his head, showing me a full head of lightning white hair, then holds up a new sheet. Come over tomorrow. I nod and he draws his curtain closed, leaving me standing there with my flashlight in one hand and a marker in the other. I stare at the house across the street, which is definitely bigger than ours, but I'm not sure I'd call it nicer. From the chipped paint on the porch to the cracked driveway to the gutter separating at the seams, everything looks like it's in need of repair. Upon closer look, there's a little half door on the side of the house that looks like it might lead to a root cellar. But it's impossible to say because if it is a door, it's covered over with so many wooden boards and bent nails. There's no way it could ever be opened. If that weren't enough, metal padlocks gleam from hinges between the wooden boards, daring someone to try to gain entry. Overkill doesn't even begin to cover it. I shake my head and go back to bed, staring up at the ceiling, the sound of my dad's, will, of my dad's words swirling around in my brain. Raven Brooks will be your city. Maybe it will be. There's the windowsill like a bench and a kid across the street who knows the difference between a half diamond and a ball pick. There's a newspaper that everyone still subscribes to and a university where mum's giant science brain is needed. I'm almost asleep again before I remember why I was looking out the window in the first place. I settle into an, into an uneasy sleep with the memory of a scream that no one but me seemed to hear. Chapter 3 The kid across the street is named Aaron Peterson and his house is made of doors. Not really, but it feels that way. The first time I go over, I open three doors before I finally find the bathroom. Then I go to the kitchen for a glass of water and get lost trying to find his room. Don't feel bad. Everyone gets a little turned around at first. He tells me after I finally find my way back. Then he shrugs. Old houses are weird. I nod like I agree, but I've lived in old, ho in old houses. The turquoise house is old too. None of them have been like this one though with side staircases that lead to little half landings and some doors that don't even open. When I was seven, we lived in Northern California for a few months while my dad was still a beat reporter. My mum, always up for a good ghost story, took me to the Winchester mansion where we got to tour the house that was perpetually, obsessively built by the, by the widow of the famous Winchester rifle maker. The story went that someone told her that she and her family were being haunted by the thousands of people who'd lost their lives to her husband's gun company. She kept the builders working day and night on a house she would never finish building, so the ghosts couldn't find her in the maze of a mansion. The clearest memory I took away from the tour was a door that opened to a three-storey drop. I imagined a sleepy seven-year-old, me, staying in that twisty house. Waking in the middle of the night, looking for some place to pee, and dropping to my death after pulling the wrong knob. We don't have one of those. Aaron tells me when I relay my memory to him the next day. At least, I don't think we do. He says it so casually, I don't think he realises how strange it is that he could live in a house and not know where every door leads. At least, at first it seemed strange to me. Then I learned that there are some places in Aaron's house that are off limits. The basement's kind of a wreck, he says, but now he's less casual about it. Now he seems uncomfortable. I think back on the boarded up door on the side of their house, the one I thought led to a root cellar. Aaron doesn't have white hair, as it turns out. That was a trick of the flashlight, just one of the many weird aspects of the night being in he introduced himself to me. It's just light brown. But that's about the only ordinary quality about Aaron. He's tall, in fact. At first I thought maybe he was older than me. He's my age, though, and he acts like he's 50. 
It's like the giant alien overlord sucked all the childhood out of him and left behind a 12-year-old adult. It's not that he doesn't smile or joke, he just has purpose. He's also better at picking locks than me. He can find his way into the tiniest keyhole, his hands steady and precise. But that isn't why he's good. It's his patience that makes him better than me. He can sit in a turn and twitch to pick a millimetre, feel for the movement, then guide the tool through a different path, until boom, the lock springs free and the door opens. I should have gone with the rake, I say, angry at myself for not springing the hall closet upstairs that, but that particular afternoon. I'll give you an easier one next time, he says, punching my shoulder a little too hard. I punch him back harder. Man, don't be a... a what? Broad shoulders and an argyle sweater emerge from a door behind us that I swear to the aliens I didn't even know was a door. Uh, Dad, this is Nicky from across the street. Nicky from across the street, eh? Mr Peterson says, pinching an end of his curled moustache like a cartoon villain. And he looks like he could be a cartoon villain, with his wide eyes hooded by thick eyebrows and forearms bigger than my legs. If not for his unmistakable dad uniform, violet blue sweater, brown pants, high socks, I'd be halfway across the street by now. He didn't ask me a question, but he's looking at me like he's waiting on an answer. Uh, we were just picking locks in your house, fighting, cursing. Mr Peterson leans over and puts his hands on his knees, large shoulders framing the face that's now that's now six inches from mine. His carnival moustache is practically touching my cheek. I can smell spearmint on his breath. Well, Nicky from across the street, he says, and I clench my teeth together to keep them from chattering. He leans in even closer, and I think I'm going to faint. How would you like to stay for dinner? He pauses and waits for me to process what wasn't the threat it sounded like, and then his moustache lifts to reveal a row of brilliant white teeth. He leans back, tilts his head, and bellows a laugh that shakes the hallway I nearly pee myself in. I start to laugh too, because I have no idea what else to do. I feel Aaron grab my arm and drag me down the stairs, muttering something about don't know why you have to be so weird, and shoves me down the hallway so I can gather myself and wonder if he was calling his dad weird or me. I start to head down a different hallway before Aaron redirects me, just one more rabbit hole to fall through in his winding house. In the kitchen, Aaron's ten-year-old sister is wielding a seriously sharp knife over a yellow onion while Mrs Peterson smokes a cigarette with her back turned. Aaron told me his mum teaches first grade at Ravenbrook's Elementary. Kreutzmeier, give me that! Aaron lunges toward the cutting board and catches the handle of the knife just as Maya begins to pierce the wobbly onion against the wood. Mum asked me to, she says defensively, but she looks relieved. You know I'm a crier, Mrs Peterson says, exhaling a stream of smoke through the kitchen window screen. I have freakishly strong eyes! Maya says, her pride returning after being stripped of her duties. She's Aaron's polar opposite, with light red hair like her mother's. She shares her mother's small frame too, with stubby little legs that make her look younger than she should. Aaron slices the onion into fine rings and sets the knife and cutting board in the middle of the kitchen island, while Maya wipes the onion skin from where it got caught on her watch. Thanks, baby, Mrs Peterson says, stubbing out her cigarette and planting a kiss on top of Aaron's head, then one on my head, and I turn away when my face gets hot, and for some reason, Maya's face gets red too. Mrs Peterson lets me call her Diane, but it feels so weird I've just stopped calling her anything at all. I guess she's pretty, but she reminds me so much of my mum, it's nuts! I've tried to get mum to invite the Petersons over for dinner, but mum's formal about stuff like that. They should invite us first, Mum says, and that's that. Hamburgers for dinner tonight, Mrs Peterson says. You boys planning on sticking around, or are you robbing banks this evening? I turned to face the wall again, because I had a dream last night that I cracked a bank vault, and the rush I felt was so strong, I felt a little awkward when I woke up. I'm pretty sure that's not using my powers for good. Who's robbing banks? 
Mr. Peterson says, emerging once again from whatever kind of shadow a hulking guy in Argyle can hide in. Oh, Mrs. Peterson says, peering into a mixing bowl. We might not have enough hamburger for if you stay, Nicky. Aaron, you'd have to run to the store for some more. Batty, Mrs. Tillman stopped selling meat, remember? Aaron says. Oh, that's right. I keep forgetting that, says Miss says Mrs. Peterson. Aaron turns to me with a wicked smile. We could get you a tasty bulgur wheat and tofu burger, though. Maybe a cocoa powder granola bar for dessert. Eh? Whatever you love those bars, Maya says, curling her lip. It's true, Aaron says, leaning toward me. They make you fart. Maya dissolves into giggles. <laughs> a lot. What's the verdict on dinner? Mrs. Peterson asks, bringing us back on topic. You boys in or out? We're eating at Nicky's, Aaron says, and when I look at him, he widens his eyes. Right, at my house, I say, not much better at lying than Aaron is. Mrs. Peterson examines us from across the kitchen island. Maya swoops in to save the dado, bringing us back to a forgotten topic. Everyone thinks that Jesse James was the best bank robber there was, just because he was a show-off, but he couldn't have done any of that without his brother Frank. People always forget the siblings. I'm sure you could rob a bank just as successfully as your brother, Mouse, Mrs. Peterson says, lining the patties into perfect rows on the cutting board. She holds a meat tenderizer high above her head and brings it down with startling strength, moving from patty to patty with unsettling enthusiasm. Maya rolls her eyes, but I can tell she likes it when her mum calls her Mouse, just like I don't mind that my dad still calls me Narf. My parents claim that's how I used to say my name before I could say Nick. Which is weird, because it doesn't even sound the same. But whatever, it's stuck. So now I'm Narf. And from some of the nicknames I've heard out there, it could be a whole lot worse. And I'm sure your brother wouldn't dream of taking credit for your accomplishments, Mrs. Peterson adds, winking at Aaron. She brings the meat hammer down on the patty again, and I jump before I can catch myself. Remember... Family makes you stronger, Mrs. Peterson says. Isn't that right, honey? Mrs. Peterson turns her head to the side to address her husband, but her eyes never meet his. Mr. Peterson just stands there for a second, surveying his family across the kitchen island before moving to the sink to wash his hands. Not necessarily, he says, with his back turned to us all, and from the way he says it, I can tell that's all he wants to say on the subject. Either Mrs. Peterson doesn't notice, or she doesn't care. Oh, don't be a grump. You don't really mean that. Mrs. Peterson flashes me a smile and rolls her eyes, which might be convincing if her if her heart if her hands weren't shaking so hard she has to set down the meat tenderizer. Mr. Peterson scrubs his fingernails meticulously at, at the sink. I sneak a glance at Aaron, and he's watching his dad too. Maya's moved to the other side of the island, and she's fidgeting with the ties on one of the bar stool cushions. I'm waiting for the punchline, for Mr. Peterson to whip around and bark that insane laugh from under his moustache, and he doesn't turn around. Mrs. Peterson tries a joke. Oh, well, I'm afraid you're stuck with us, darling. We're Petersons to the bone. Now Mr. Peterson does turn around, so fast that the towel in his hand makes a whipping sound in the air. You know what's so interesting about bones, Diane? He says with a smile that's way different than the one he cracked in the hallway upstairs. This one bears both rows of his teeth, and they don't part. He just talks right through them. Maya moves a little closer to Aaron. I think I do too. Not all of them are necessary. Maya reaches for Aaron's hand, and he squeezes hers back. It's true, Mr. Peterson continues, even though no one contested it. It's remarkable what the human body can survive without. Pluck one bone out and the body keeps on living. Mrs. Peterson is shaping the hamburger patties, and she's been working on that same patty since her husband started talking. I don't think she's thinking about hamburgers anymore. She closes her eyes, and I want to close mine too, but I'm afraid to look away. There's just one bone you can't live without. The funny bone. Mr. Peterson runs to Maya and scoops her up by the waist. And for a panic second, I think he's actually going to hurt her. But she starts giggling immediately. And her giggle turns to a frantic laugh. And I see that he's not hurting her at all. He's tickling her ribs. 
Where's that bone? Where's that funny bone? He says, suddenly playful. And I think I misconstru and I think I misconstrued the whole scene until I look at Aaron and Mrs. Peterson, who are sharing a look I can't quite understand. It's solemn, though. Nothing like the exchange Mr. Peterson is having with Maya as he throws her over his shoulder and begins to spin her around. Let's go, Aaron says to me under his breath, and I don't argue. Once we're outside, we don't say a word until we're, until we're at at least three blocks from our street and halfway to the train tracks on the other side of the woods that border Raven Brooks. The train from earlier has stopped, but the ground still squishes as when, we, when we walk. Where are we going? I ask Aaron, when I feel like it's okay to ask him anything at all. You'll see, he says, but doesn't look at me. There's something I want to show you. Chapter 4 The factory should be fenced off. Maybe it was at some point, but it sure isn't now. And we shouldn't be able to walk right through the front door, but we do. I used to love golden apples, Aaron says, and his eyes get all dreamy. I wait for an explanation, but all I get is a look of shock. You've never had golden apples? I'm going to need you to stop saying golden apples, I say. It sounds like something my grandma would make me eat. I shake a crooked finger at him and try on my best old granny voice. Eat your golden apples so you grow up big and strong, dearie. These wouldn't make anyone big or strong. They were sweets, Aaron says. I don't know what they put in those things, but I wouldn't sleep for days after I ate one. Guess that explains why they stopped making them, I say. But Aaron doesn't respond. He just looks away. The old golden apple factory doesn't look like much. I mean, it's an abandoned factory in the middle of the woods that miraculously only we seem to know about. So that's pretty cool. But besides the still operational conveyor belt and overall creepy atmosphere that, that comes from any abandoned place, I can't figure out why Aaron was so stoked to show me the factory. It's virtually empty and I'm starving. Plus, my parents would have been so happy that I've made a friend. They probably would have fallen all over themselves to feed us. Dad would have busted out the Susie Queese for sure. Maybe Aaron just wanted to get away from his house. I know I did. Away from his dad, anyway. Come on, Aaron says, waving me up a ramp and toward a back door with an unlit exit sign over it. It's not an exit, though. Instead, the door leads to a hallway filled with more doors to the left and the right, each with at least two locks bolting them shut. A lockpick's dream. Whoa, I breathe, and Aaron nods. Each one leads to another door, too, he says. All locked. I stare at the corridor like we've uncovered a secret stash of golden apples. I've only made it through half of them. They've all got different brands of latches and padlocks. Here, I'll show you my favourite room. Aaron beckons me to the middle of the corridor and fishes his tools from his pocket. Like me, he always carries his case. I hardly know what my pocket feels like anymore without it. With his signature smoothness, he springs the first lock easily, a simple leather handle lock with a clutch. The door opens to a musty smelling office, its furniture still haunting the room, waiting for its occupant to return. It's windowless and the light switch doesn't work. None of them work, Aaron says. I think the conveyor belt runs on an old generator or something. In answer to our need, Aaron scoops up a heavy old flashlight from the top of a nearby filing cabinet. Found this baby on the first day, he says, illuminating his face from under his chin like he's about to tell me a ghost story. Then he twitches his eyebrows up and down. Follow me. I hear scurrying against the walls, and I know it's rats. I mean, it, it, it was a sweet factory. I just pray to the giant aliens they keep to the walls and the vents. What? Aaron asks, his voice taunting. You have a thing about rats? I have a thing about rabies, I say. Hold this, Aaron says, handing me the flashlight. Then he fishes out a hook pick and leans his ear against the door. This is when I know Aaron is really at work. It's like he's listening to the door's heartbeat. I don't even bother asking why he locks the doors after he's sprung them open. It's because each time is like the first time. And there's no feeling like that. With the tiniest flick of his wrist, the pin clinks and the door groans open. Inside is a treasure trove of broken machinery. 
I had a feeling you'd want to see this, he says, and I hardly know what to say. There's this cartoon I used to watch, okay, that I maybe possibly still watch with a, with a ridiculously rich duck. He has so much money that he keeps all his gold and jewels and coins and bills piled in a room-sized vault, and he swims through the treasure like it's water. That's what I wanted to do when Aaron opened this door. The secret office behind the regular office was probably considered a junk room, a kind of elephant's graveyard where electronics journeyed to eventually die as new hardware was invented to replace them. Maybe the tech guy at the Golden Apple Corporation figured he could make a buck selling those old monitors or keyboards, or security cameras for parts, but the factory shut down, and the already useless machines slept behind a locked door, guarded by an empty chair and another locked door. Dude, say something so I know you're not having a stroke or something. You smell like rat poop, I say, because it's the only way I can tell him no one has ever trusted me with treasure. Yeah, you're gonna want to scrape your shoes before you get home, he says, and I think he understands that thank you would be embarrassing. I take what I can carry. The motor from an old vacuum, the fan from a CPU, a keyboard and about five extension cords. I'll bring a bag next time, I say to Aaron, but he's already walking ahead of me, out the hallway and back onto the factory floor. He locks the door behind him so no one else can get in easily and vandalise our secret place. Before I know it, we're tromping over the wooded path that leads into the trees and away from the train tracks. Then he pauses and I turn to see what it is he's staring at. There, just over the tree line, is a red and gold seat, rocking and creaking on a mild breeze, attached to the top of a large metal arc. Is that a Ferris wheel? I, I ask, already pushing past Aaron to cut a path through the overgrowth. I'm expecting to find a clearing full of other confection-coloured rides and ticket booths. One of the millions of, of county fairs that pop up on main streets or in open parking lots during the summer months. But what I find instead is a ghost town. The Ferris wheel cars are paralysed, moved only by the warm breeze that blows by. The wheel itself is covered in so much graffiti, I can't even tell what colour it used to be. And not the cool kind of graffiti that's left by, that's left by daredevil street artists. The ugly kind of graffiti that's meant to erase whatever is underneath. I see the opening to a fun house that looks more horror than fun, with its apple-shaped head and its wide mouth with bared teeth. I see a chaired concession stand that's missing its roof and a collapsed stage still encircled by, by, by tiered cement seats. There's a carousel of vandalised animals prancing across a motionless gate there's the top curve of a roller coaster track cresting above the tree line. A long car perched at the apex. There used to be more, lots more. A directionally obscured in oily burn residue tells me at least that much. But whatever this place was, it's dead and buried now. Across the concession stand, in faded white letters over red paint, reads Golden Apple Amusement Park. They, they made a park too? I ask, incredulous that Aaron didn't show me this just as eagerly as the factory. Sure, there were no locks or machines, but there was plenty to mess with between the Ferris wheel and the roller coaster. I mean, the cars have to be around somewhere. I bet I could get the carousel going again, I say, stacking my factory treasures against a tree and racing across the overgrown park. I emerge from the brush to find him looking at the ground, his hands crossed over his chest. He's acting like he's mad at me. What's the matter? Nothing. I just don't like it here, he says evasively. Are you joking? What's not to like? Seriously, why is this place like completely hidden? It's not hidden, Aaron says, but he almost spits it out like he's disgusted with me. Okay, I say clearly terrible at sidestepping whatever landmine is buried under all this ash. Ash? Like maybe it burnt down. Did something... What happened here? I ask. And Aaron looks up. His eyes look like they're ready to shoot up to shoot lasers. And I'm close enough that I think he actually might throw a punch at me. But I still have no idea why.
Then he seems to catch himself and his shoulders relax a little. I shouldn't have come this way. I forgot this was here. But I don't think that's true. I think maybe he wanted me to see it. So did it, like, burn down or something? I prod. Aaron just stares at me. I live down the street from a house that burnt down once, I say, starting to ramble. It was a space heater or something, and everyone got out okay, but the house was completely torched, just like this place looks. I keep waiting for Aaron to say something, to save me from my babbling, but he keeps staring. The sudden silence is a stark contrast from the factory, only moments ago. Just when I think we're going to suffocate under all that awkwardness, Aaron shakes his head. Let's get out of here, he says, and even though I'm relieved to go, I know I've let Aaron down somehow. He doesn't say a word for the rest of the way home, just a casual see you around before he steps onto his unlit porch and disappears into his house. I replay the night in my head, the house with all its twists and turns, his dad's unique sense of humour, the factory, the amusement park. I tried to figure out when things turned weird. Aaron was squirmy after we left his house, but that seemed to wear off once, once he showed me the factory. It was only after we got to the burnt remains of the amusement park that Aaron's entire demona changed. The guy who shared his trove of abandoned electronics had disappeared, and the angry, scared kid he'd left in his place needed me to know something. What were you trying to tell me, you weirdo? I ask Aaron's dark porch, because I know what it's like to want someone to guess how you're feeling. It's way easier than saying it. I set my electronics hall beside the door and decide I'll leave it there until the morning. Maybe by then, I'll have a plausible explanation for where they came from. I barely have time to close the front door before Mum and Dad pounce on me. Did you have fun? What's he like? Are, are you in the same grade? Have you had dinner yet? Yeah, he's okay. Same grade, I say. Then I shrug. Not hungry. Mum's palm cups, cups my forehead. You're coming down with something? I just don't feel like eating, okay? Mum and Dad exchange a look. He looks like our son, Dad says, but he reaches for my face, tilting my chin to see up my nose, pinching my cheeks to open my mouth. I don't know, Lou. He could be a changeling. Hardy ha ha, I say, swatting Dad's hand away. Well, you have two choices, Mum says. You can stay here and eat like a normal 12-year-old, or you can run a boring ar arraigned with your boring mother. I hadn't noticed before that she's wearing her rain jacket and shoes. I need a book from my office, she says. A book from her office at the university. Your office is near the campus library, right? Mum cocks her head to the, to, the, to the side. Just the science library? But does it have newspapers? Like old records? Mum looks like she wants to ask another question, then loses interest. Probably, she says, grabbing her car keys. Our shoes squeak against the orange and white lin linoleum of the life sciences building on the east end of campus. The university is old, and some of the original buildings are really pretty. All brick and dark wooden pillars. The east end of the grounds, though, was built sometime in the 60s, and I'm pretty sure that was the last time anyone's touched it. That's one of the reasons the school is so excited about having Mum on the fa on the faculty. She's a chemist, and not just any chemist. She's written but a couple of papers on some experiment she did that got published in some hoity-toity journals. And now people know that Luane Roth is super smart. Smart scientists mean more student enrolment, which means maybe the school will finally be able to buy some new equipment and remodel the bathrooms. Or so Dad says. Which way is the library? I ask Mum. Down the stairs, to the left. But Narf, I'm only going to be a minute. Meet me down there, I call over my shoulder, disappearing down the stairs and around the dark hallway before she can tell me no. The science library is smaller than the most elementary school libraries, which makes it easy to find the periodical section. Most of the tables are piled with neatly stacked science journals, well worn with sticky covers and dog-eared and dog pages. Those aren't going to help me, though. 
I keep scanning the periodical shelf until finally, in the very bottom corner, I spy a pile of old newspapers. The masthead on one I recognise from the sign on the building where Dad works, the Ravenbrook's banner. I sit on the ground and pull the stack onto my lap, skimming through the headlines as quickly as I can for anything with the words golden and apple. I'm a third of the way through the stack when I hear footsteps echoing through the hall above. I recognise my mum's urgent stride. Even when she's not in a hurry, she moves fast. Come on, I mutter, flipping faster through the pile, but nothing is jumping out at me. I skip to the bottom of the stack, but in my hurry, I fumble the papers and send the collection scattering. Narf, are you making a mess down there? I hear my mum's footsteps begin to descend the stairs. Ready to admit my defeat, I start scooping the stack back together when I spy a paper with bold letters spelling out the headline. I grab the paper and try to skim what I can, but Mum is almost at the bottom of the stairs, so I commit a mortal sin. Aliens, forgive me. Tearing the newsprint, I pull the page from from the paper and shove it into my pocket, before my mum pokes her head around the corner. What were you trying to do? Build a nest? Mum asks her hand massaging the back of her neck. I, I I didn't tear anything. I am, without a doubt, the world's worst criminal. Mum knows it too. She shakes her head at me, then helps me clean my mess before we leave the library mostly the way we found it. At home, I wait until I can hear my parents snoring before pulling the article from my pocket. On this day exactly one year ago, life for the, for the Y family changed forever. And the town of Ravenbrooks lost a piece of its heart. What should have been a day of family fun at the newly opened Golden Apple Amusement Park turned to unimaginable tragedy when a mechanical flaw in the park's much buzzed out Rotten Core roller coaster caused the death of seven year old Lucy Yi. A close up picture of a smiling girl stares back at me from the page, her eyes sparkling under a fringe of dark bangs. I read the caption. Reluctantly. Lucy Yi was a first grader at Ravenbrooks Elementary School. She was a first grader, I think to myself. Was because she's dead now? Is that the something Aaron wanted me to guess? How could I ever have guessed something that, that horrific had happened right there in the same park where we were standing earlier tonight? I keep reading. It was just so shocking. I mean... An amusement park is supposed to be a carefree place, says China Bell, a former Golden Apple assembly line worker at the factory a mile from the park. I'll tell you this. No kid of mine is going to set foot on one of those contraptions ever again. This just goes to show you never really know what's safe, says Bill Markson as he sweeps the sidewalk in front of the pup and pus pet supply. You know what I think? I think they rushed to open before they'd done all those safety tests they should have done. Yet not all of Ravenbrooks blames the Golden Apple Corporation or the builders responsible for its construction. Glady's a wing tries to hold on to the happy memories despite the long shadow cast by the confection maker's meteoric fail from 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 popularity. I will never forget riding the Ferris wheel with my youngest son on opening day. I've never seen him smile that big. People ought to be ashamed of burning that place down like they did. I read Gladys a wings quote three more times to make sure I've read it right. They burned it down, I breathe. In a week dominated by suffering for a family and reflection on the further tragedy that could have struck, angry parents and townspeople gathered at the shuttered Golden Apple Amusement Park to grieve together. But what was meant to be a candlelight vigil turned riotous when several disgruntled citizens turned their anger toward the park. By then, blame for young Lucy Yee's death had fallen to the Golden Apple Corporation and the amusement park's lead. I flip the page over, but all I find are stories of the neighbour of the neighbouring town zoo and a sale on organic chickens at the and the natural grocer when they were still selling meat, I suppose. I turn back to the article and see that the story continues on page B3. I lay the crumpled newsprint at my feet and lean against the bed, my head all the way back as I stare up at the ceiling. So what's what Aaron couldn't find a way to tell me? Not that I can blame him. 
How do you bring up something that awful in casual conversation? As awful as the history of, the, of that place is, that isn't what's eating at me either. What I can't figure out is why Aaron brought me there in the first place. He obviously wanted me to know what had happened there. But why? I fall asleep with thoughts of Aaron and his family whirling through my brain. Mrs. Peterson's trembling hands as she puffed away on, on a cigarette by the window. The look she exchanged with Aaron when his dad talked about removing bones. The way... The way Maya's face lost all its colour just before her dad picked her up and tickled her ribs. That night, I dream of small, fragile, fragile skeletons crouched low to the ashy ground, bounding around a darkened ferris wheel that's being slowly choked to death by vines.